Hi, HR Nation, it's Chris Rainey. Welcome to HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most innovative and successful HR practitioners five days a week. Today, we're joined by Susie McNamara, Vice President of Global Leadership and Development and Learning at Fortive. Uh, Susie, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. How are you? I'm not too bad. Not too bad. Just telling you before the show how uh, I'm sort of in that dad zone at the moment of being a paranoid dad, (laughs) worried about the baby at night, not getting much sleep. Um, I'm glad to hear from you before the show that I'm not going crazy and everyone goes through it. You're good. (laughs) Fantastic. Um, Susie, before we jump in, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself personally and your journey to where we are today. Well, so personally, outside of work, uh, I spend most of my time being a parent. Uh, I, as of January 10th, I now have five kids. So we have a very busy household. And anytime, I, yeah, anytime I spend not working, um, I'm spending with the family, um, mostly being a chauffeur, toting kids around to different things and um, you know, trying to make some fun memories along the way. So that's uh, how, how I'm spending most of my time outside of work. Um, professionally, I... I currently lead leadership development and learning for Fortive, which is an industrial technology conglomerate. So we run companies all over the world. Um, prior to that, though, I had a bit of an, uh, an unusual path to get into HR. So I joined General Mills about uh, probably about 18 years ago now um, in, in their sales organization. And so I was recruited off campus, was in the sales program, you know, had intentions of becoming a sales leader. That's all I wanted to do. And it was about two or three years in that uh, I was actually sitting in a training program and I was sitting in the back of the, of the room and I have these occasional, what I call frying pan to the head moments where just as these big ahas hit me in life or, you know, it could be something big, something small, but I had a frying pan to the head moment um, watching the, the woman in front of the room who was leading this session. And I just sat back and I thought, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to have that enthusiasm, that passion for my work. And, and it started to make me realize that maybe I didn't have as much enthusiasm and passion for my work. So it took me a few years and I worked my way into a sales training role. And then my, my learning roles just continued to kind of increase uh, in terms of, um, you know, my, uh, my impact on, on the company and increased in terms of changing into different functions within the organization. Um, but then ultimately decided a couple of years ago um, to try something new. And so I left a 15-year career at General Mills to join Fortive. Um, Fortive at the time was about a year old. I think they just had their one-year birthday or anniversary, I guess is probably a better way to say it, but they celebrated it like a birthday. And I saw this as an opportunity to come into this new company and really put everything that I had learned in my past um, into practice in a new place and in a new environment to see if I could have a different kind of impact on a different organization. And so that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Amazing. What well, I love, always love that question because, you know, everyone seems to, no one, maybe probably two or three people out of the hundred plus episodes plan to work in HR. So everyone yeah. seems to find their way there through some route yeah. or another. It's always a fascinating journey. But one thing I want to spend some time on, which we spoke about before we, we hit record on the podcast is that decision-making process that you have to go through yourself. You know, after working at a company for 15 years, right? Yeah. You know, it's incredible that, and, and I'm assuming you know, the reason you were there is that they kept giving you different opportunities to work yeah. in different parts of the business, right? Which like, yeah. like any organization I see to that retains talent, that's how they do it. They give them opportunities to grow, develop, right? That's right. And could you just, you, you, you told me before the show, just give our, our listeners an idea of, you know, what was that mental process? You mentioned you were sort of writing things down and, yeah. uh, and, and could you just share a bit of those details? Yeah. So I'll preface this with saying that towards the end of my time at General Mills, General Mills is an amazing company. Um, And I was in my dream job working with my dream team that I had built doing dream work. So, I mean, there was nothing that would have suggested that it was time to leave yet. However, um, you know, through my, my last few years there being a specialist in learning, I did have this realization um, or at least a a reflection within myself to say, you know, I'm, I'm very much a specialist. So I started to think about the future at General Mills and will I be able to continue to add unique value to the company when the, that company is all I know. Um, and so I, I started to kind of on the side, just make some lists of, okay, if I were to leave at some point, even though I didn't want to leave then, if I were to leave at some point, what are some of those qualities that I would look for in a future company? And so one of the things that I wrote down was um, startup with a question mark next to it. 
So I loved the idea of a startup and the excitement of, of creating something from scratch. I didn't love the idea after coming from this big 150 year old company, well established. So I didn't like the idea of kind of the ramen noodle picture that everybody has in their head of mm -hmm. startup means, you know, 14, 15 hour days, you're just barely getting by. I didn't love that idea, but I liked the idea of kind of the new, you can build a culture from scratch, you know, from the work that I do, your leaders are hungry for whatever, you know, whatever we decide we, we kind of need them to be. So they're hungry yeah. for that new learning, those new experiences. Clean slate, right? You get to yeah, the clean slate. Mm -hmm. And so to, to be able to have this opportunity to go to this kind of air quotes startup that was really a spinoff, but, but still, you know, had a lot of the characteristics of a startup. It was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. So how long have you been in the organization now? So it'll be two years in August. So still wow. pretty new. Wow. How was the first uh, sort of month in the organization? What did that look like? How did you? Okay, so this is what's interesting um, about a company like Fortive. Uh, my, so we have what for senior leaders, we have a process called immersion. Um, it's not like any onboarding process I've ever seen. So our senior leaders get put into a 10 week immersion, which means the first 10 weeks, you do not do your job. Um, you go out, uh, it's, it's all built for you. You get into some of our um, core kind of continuous improvement processes. You go to different events, you fly all around the world oftentimes to meet the different leaders. It depends on your role. It's completely customized. There's not sure. kind of a standard um, deal. So I started and I went into my immersion, you know, the first few weeks I, I, my first week I spent painting on a gas or on a, um, on an assembly line, uh, fixing cool. some defects on, um, fuel dispensers. Not exactly. It was, it was certainly more manual labor than I had done in quite some time. I used to joke. <laughs> I'm it, saying cool in my head that you got exposed to that, not as in the job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it was interesting, you know, to go from, you know, very kind of white collared to earplugs yeah. and safety glasses and um, do that for a week. I went to India. So I had, an interesting few weeks. Um, but then it was my fourth week, I got pulled into something completely different. So they stopped my immersion and they put me into um, basically sort of this innovation think tank team for three months. So I didn't do my job actually for, wow. I didn't really start doing my job until about a year ago. I was uh, put on an electric vehicle innovation team and we were um, one of our largest companies makes most of the fuel dispensers in the US and a very large percentage of fuel dispensers outside of the US. And we know that electrification is, is coming. It's here. Don't know when. It's, here. And, it's here right now, really. Let's be honest. It, in Europe, especially, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's moving faster. But, but there's going to be this need to be able to power up electric vehicles mm -hmm. and have a better infrastructure, which uh, most places don't have. And so our team spent three months basically as a startup to figure out what that next business model is for us. So nothing to do with HR. I didn't get put on it because I'm HR. I got put on it because I would eventually be tasked with helping us take this process and figure out how to teach it and scale it. Mm -hmm. um, but not, ex not at all what I, what I envisioned doing, you know, basically spent my first four to six months not doing any of my work, not doing anything related to HR, but really deeply immersing myself in the company. Mm. Well, I think it's an absolutely incredible idea. Uh, and it makes, I think every company should do something like this as well, because yeah. you know, it was always says if I HR, learn the business. Well, yeah. how about how about live and breathe the business for the first That's four right. to six months, <laughs> and actually, you know, go down to the shop floor and you know, paint, paint, paint. 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 While, <laughs> while you're painting, you're talking to people though. That normally, you know, if you're coming in at a VC exactly. level, you're not going to talk to people who are on the line. Yeah. So to me, that was the most powerful aspect of the entire immersion. Yes, I got to paint, and I was in India talking to customers. I mean, I got to do really interesting things. But the best and most powerful part to me. And kind of the biggest ahas I got was from talking to employees yeah. who I normally have reached and hearing about their challenges, hearing just, you can just tell from the way they talk, pick up on what the culture is, how are we doing on diversity and inclusion? You can mm. get all of that from a 30 minute conversation with someone while you're painting fuel dispensers. So what's powerful to me is that people respect when you're in immersion. So it's not like, oh, you're in immersion, but you're going to do the rest of your job at night. Mm -hmm. People leave you alone. I mean, they, they wow. certainly use... They set up time with you. They have meet and greets. They want to share with you what they've been up to, um, you know, kind of start to help you understand the strategies and those parts of it. But there isn't, you aren't necessarily tasked with a bunch of deliverables. So I think that is, you know, it's one thing to have something like this, but to make it truly about learning and not about learning and then doing your job. on. Because that's what normally happens, isn't it? Uh, and that yeah. normally, normally sure. it's a combination of those two because companies are like, well, we can't just have this individual because we need a, to get a return on investment now. 
yeah, yeah, <laughs> immediately. Right. And that's, that's the mistake I think the companies make. And you have to understand that it is an investment. It is an investment. Yeah. You know, it's not going to pay off immediately, but it will, obviously, um, from what we've been talking about. For anyone listening, you know, the payoff's obvious, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're getting to know the organization, the culture, especially in your role as well. Like, if you're having to work with a team to come up with a strategy, the people strategy around that, and the learning strategy, it's essential, right. even, even more essential that you get to understand the organization and, and the learning needs and different cultures that exist in those different countries, for example, I'm sure it changed, right? On the yeah. different cultures, the different countries that you went to as well, different needs, different culture as well. So that must be quite interesting as well. So what does the week, month look like when you kind of moved into the role full time, you know, ready to rock and roll? Um, so there were a couple of things that were very important and, and just low hanging fruit that I identified of things that let's just get after this um, as part of the strategy. And so um, there were two areas, the way I think about my role and kind of the way I've built my team is really around two areas. One is what I call development for all. So the things that we do that impact everyone. So how do we enable all of our employees to have, you know, a, a strong, you know, or have opportunities to learn. So that's one piece of it. And then there is this, what I would consider development for the few. So what are we doing for the few people, the most senior leaders, our highest potential leaders, leaders of people. So there's that side of it. So um, as I started to kind of concoct my plan, um, there was some pretty big low hanging fruit initially that I saw on the development for all side. So I mentioned the Florida business system. This is this is core to who we do. It's not just, oh, we have continuous improvement in supply chain and that's it. The Ford of Business System touches every single employee, no matter what function you're in, no matter what you do, you are expected to embrace what we call the FBS mindset. And so in order to be able to do that, in order to have this truly be our culture, people need to have, it needs to be accessible. People need to be able to figure out what it is, you know, especially with a company like ours that's growing constantly. So we're not in startup mode necessarily anymore, but we grow partially by acquisition. So we are constantly bringing new people into the fold. So we need to be able to take these new companies that we acquire and, and kind of penetrate into those companies, the, the FBS mindset. And one of the things that I discovered is that it's, it's, we have this powerful set of tools, but the way that we were teaching it and the way that we, we are still teaching it in, in many ways, it's, it's really based on a few people having deep knowledge and it requires you to go somewhere. It's not to scalable. It. It's not scalable. Yeah, it's not scalable at mm. all. Um, and, and there's reasons for that. Th these tools are there. Some of them are pretty complex. Um, and um, I think there is, there's kind of a cultural concern that people will misuse them if they don't deeply understand how to use them right. Um, and so, so as far as one of the first areas that I really focused on was just basically to say, hey, give me one tool, give me something to play with. We ended up choosing the tool that our CEO had um, determined was the most important area for us to really um, make some improvements in. It's called the, our problem solving process. So we said, so I basically said, give me problem solving. Let, let's just try an experiment here. We don't have to scale it big. Let's not even worry about that. Let's not worry about people getting into their hands who are going to misuse it or misapply it, but let's just try something because if we don't try anything, then we'll just continue to do it the same way. And that also, by the way, creates capacity constraint for the few people who are having to teach this stuff, like scale aside, it creates actually quite a bit of organizational pain. And so I was able to get the buy-in to just say, fine, let's just take this one set of tools and let's create something different. And so but we when, ended up- When you say tool, what do you mean by that? Is it like a software? Is it like an LMS platform? Or you know, what, what, what do you mean by that? No, problem solving is actually, uh, it's a process. Oh, it's um, a pro that you've developed yourselves, right? Just to, yes. Okay. It's a process. We developed it ourselves. I'm sure there's some sort of Toyota production. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. In there, but it's a process that we use to solve our most complicated problems. And it's about kind of understanding root, root cause and deeply understanding the problem. And then, um, you know, brainstorming solutions and then creating mm -hmm, what we sure. call countermeasures to, to, um, to try and fix the problem and then sustaining it over time trimmed down version of what it is no, of course yeah of course <laughs> so we so we did problem solving and i found at the time i was still building my team so i didn't have a lot of capacity um and so we found a vendor partner to help us create basically kind of an online suite where we mm -hmm. took we did there, there were sort of two two things that we did one is that we put the stuff out there for people to be able to access which was important because re previously it sat in these you know 300 page PowerPoint decks. That, that's you what I mean. You, yeah. You had to build an online content system for people to build. Right. Yeah. And, and nobody's going to read the 300 point deck. Like that's not how people learn. No, so no. That was part of it. And then the other part was to take that 300 point 
you know, 300 page deck and chunk it down. So we, we microsized all of it so that, you know, there's, there's this process, but within the process, there are about 50 different steps. So you could go and really pinpoint your learning to, I just need to know how to do experimentation. I just need to know how to do voice of customer, whatever that thing is, you can either go through all of it or you can narrowly focus on just that little area and consume something that's going to take you about two to three minutes to learn what you need and then move on. Um, but the more important part of this was that in, you know, some companies will just take that and say, yep, we've got it online now we're done. But for us, that isn't enough. It is about the application. And so what we did is that we, be, we, we created this online suite and we made it part of pre-work to go into a Kaizen event, which is typically um, the way we run Kaizen's. It's a one to two week event where you get the right people in the, in the room focused on solving a very specific problem. And you, basically try to solve the problem in within that one week or two weeks or whatever you have. Mm -hmm. And so it was really less about just learning it. And it was more about learning what you need to know to then immediately go in and apply it. And then once you've applied it and you've started to build that muscle, you can then go back and grab, you know, as you're, as you're working two to three months out, you can grab again in, in the library, one or two pieces that you need. That's very important <laughs> because this, we always focus on the learning, but the most important part is using it in the execution. Right. And yeah. I love the fact that you've immediately taken that step to embed it in that person's learning and obviously for the company to benefit from that as well. So it's kind of right. part of the process now, not just your, not, not just your individual development need. Yeah, that's right. And then, you know, for this one too, we wrote a wave. So we, I knew once a year, our CEO hosts a, a Kaizen event. Um, and he, it usually means that he's hosting events all around the world. They're usually happening in two to three sites. And, and our CEO and all of his senior leaders, all of our presidents, all participate in this Kaizen as for their own development to ensure that they are staying sharp um, in, you know, our problem solving process or whatever we deem is the most important area where we need them to build capability. And then they also coach and, you know, get practice on that during these weeks. So we rode that wave. We knew a CEO Kaizen was coming up. And so we built this into that so that we could scale a little bit more quickly and, and get a lot more, get a lot more data points on whether or not this was working. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of things kind of built into that. It's the learn and apply immediately um, to, to do kind of quick changes like this. You've got to sort of find things that are already happening and sort of attach it to those versus Makes just sense. Yeah. standing enough on its own and wondering why, like, Oh, we built this. It didn't work. Well, why <laughs> yeah. not? You know? Yeah. You already have the, it's already part of the, you know, the business. It's already got the buy-in from the senior leaders. Right. You know, it makes it, it already delivers value. Um, so obviously, attaching it on the back of that makes complete sense. And just, just, uh, just for clarity, are those did you break that PDF up into small video parts, or was it, you know, audio, or digest, or just like you broke down the PDF into sort of digestible chunks? It was a blended approach. I would say that uh, feedback that we got was that it was really heavy on just reading. So it was, yeah. you know, we put the PowerPoint and it ended up, you know, we wrote it like something that you would read. The idea was sort of when we read a story on, you know, our computers, you scroll down for maybe a page and a half. So mm -hmm. a lot of them read like that. Some of them were really short. Most of them, if there was some demonstration needed, we then did a video. This was quick and dirty, by the way, we pulled this off in like a month. Um, and this, I mean, it was a massive amount of content that we pulled off that quickly. So like the videos, I, literally remember recording them on a Sunday hiding in a bathroom in my basement because all of my kids were home and it was loud <laughs> and I was recording like me yeah. <laughs> um, and using an app on my phone. I mean, talk about quick and dirty. It was inexpensive. It was just, let's get this out there. But we did try to, um, we tried to make it, you know, people learn in different ways and some people can just read something and that's good enough for them. But we know that, that other people need different things. And then there were also knowledge checks along the way just to give people kind of something to do um, because yes. otherwise just sitting and reading for people as well yeah. in, in it. And I'm, I'm really happy you mentioned that you kind of just skipped over that, like, but it's a huge part for everyone listening guys. It doesn't have to be polished. I say this all the time. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to have huge, you know, bring in a production team and spend yeah. you know, tens of thousands of pounds. It's about the, the content itself. Yep. You know, the value of the content itself, not the quality of the picture. Don't get me wrong. I think audio, you can't really compromise on as much if you're doing video, but the video you certainly can as well. As long as you have the right content, people, people will gain value, right? So yeah, don't record in a bathroom. You'll get an echo. <laughs> hiding from kids, sometimes that's the only place I could go. You know, we, we were speaking beforehand before the show about the evolution of leadership development and learning. What, what does that shift, shift look like from you from when you started to where we are now? What, what's the biggest developments you've seen? 
Well, so I feel like if you go to external conferences or, you know, even if I think about the ones that I attended five or 10 years ago, you know, it was all about technologies coming. Well, first of all, you saw the, you saw the um, kind of progression for a while. It was all about e-learning and more yeah. is better. And you just, anything that you can, you put it up into an e-learning and then send it out. And if you build it, they will come sort of thing. Um, what I would say though, is, I mean, certainly technology has completely changed the practice. So anybody who's doing this work, who isn't in some way thinking about their employees now as consumers and thinking about the way that we all consume and learn outside of work. I mean, I, I try to think mostly about what we do outside of work because it's typically far more modern and seamless than what many 100%, of us hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so technology is certainly a big part of it. And, but you know, the, the thing that I, I often think about is, you know, I'll say access is everything, but then I also kind of question that is access everything because I have seen some companies and, you know, even people that I've worked with in the past, you know, they think about access and it's just, I'm just going to keep building, 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 building. I'm going to throw stuff out there. People just want a lot of options and they'll get what they need and everyone's different. So they need lots of different things. Um, I would challenge that to say that in certain cases, it's okay to have a lot of stuff, but people are really overwhelmed. And especially unless your, unless your company has this really, um, you know, modern and uh, well thought out infrastructure where it's really easy to find things, then I don't know that more is actually better and that all access is actually better. I think being thoughtful about what you put out there and putting out the right stuff that is actually getting after the problems and understanding what those problems are that's better. And then in some cases, especially on the leadership side of the work that I do, I don't think more is better. Um, you know, certainly as we think about the things that we're doing for our highest potential leaders, I'd rather create something extremely meaningful, something that's just going to be almost an epiphany to people that's really going to change 20 people than something that's sort of watered down that I can scale to a thousand people that, that probably won't last in, or have a lasting impact. Yeah. So I think there is still this balance. And I think you know, I also think that people think, hey, as long as I know how to do video or as long as I know how to, you know, kind of throw together a it doesn't work uh, like that. one pager that that's enough. And it's not. I, I, I think that I've seen a lot of people in the practice sort of losing sight of those core skills that that, you know, kind of that we've leveraged for many years. Things like being a good consultant, understanding the jobs to be done, understanding what problem you're trying to solve and then using really good design skills to create something meaningful. Um, I think some of that has been lost just sort of in this through design. technology and content. Yeah. 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 I, I completely agree with you. And um, I'm having the same, we had the same uh, challenge internally. So we have over 700 HR executives who are part of our community uh, who are paying members of HRD leaders. And we launched our own internal LMS and we filled it with content. Yeah. <laughs> we had hundreds of uh, sort of hour long workshops that we put in there and there are video workshops. You've got the audio, you can download the slide deck and everything. And it was too overwhelming. There's almost too yeah. much. And, uh, and also you'd think once we built it, everyone would run towards it, download the app, log in, and they'll be using it every day. No, yeah. <laughs> not the case whatsoever. Our onboarding, I wish we would have actually thought a lot more better about our onboarding strategy and about how we're going to introduce people into this. Because yeah. as you said, I'd rather them take one of our workshops, learn it and execute it and actually have it value in the organization than just overwhelming them with here's a hundred workshops around all these different HR topics. Go for it. Because right. then, because then, then they end up doing nothing. The marketing that we do in in this line of work is yep. almost as important as what we build. I would say mm -hmm. almost. I mean, you can market garbage, and you know, if you're building garbage but you're doing great at marketing, that's going to create some massive distrust. Mm -hmm. So, but but I think being thoughtful about when you're creating whatever whatever kind of learning experience you're creating, whether it's something for leaders or something that you know you want the broader um, organization to consume having that that learning product again whatever it is is only part of it i mean it's you have to be really really thoughtful about the change management that goes with it the communication that goes with it how are you going to make people want to use it and need to use it and if they aren't then you have to also have to question yourself and back way up to say what problem was i solving was i actually solving a problem you know your your point about people will say yes this content it all sounds great you know our intentions don't often match our actions i love yeah. the idea you know i could sit here and geek out on HR research all day long, but I can't actually because I don't have the, the time or capacity to do that. And I usually just block specific times. And then, you know, the resources are typically the ones that are closest That's, to me that I yeah. trust and that I've seen 
you know, that have actually proven to, to me that they can actually, you know, be useful in the work that I'm doing, but more isn't, you know, more isn't better. And if you're not thoughtful about how you're marketing things and you're not thoughtful about, you know, making sure that what you're building is reaching the right people, then mm-hmm. you're probably burning a lot of calories. Yeah. So how do you make sure that you are tailoring the experience for each of the leaders and their personal needs? I think one of the most useful things to do that's really hard, and I would say we do it sometimes, but not all the time, is not just creating learning and experience, learning experiences for people, but creating it with them. Okay. Um, because the, the, some of the most powerful experiences that I've created have been ones where I've done it with a cross-functional, global, diverse team of people who are not all HR. Um, you know, it's people who will actually be the true consumers of whatever learning product we're creating then you know that you're actually really scratching that itch that you are creating something that that will be something that they can just sort of build into their daily lives i mean that's you know nobody has that extra two hours you know or however many hours for you to watch the the thousand episodes or you know of, of your podcast nobody has that time and so how can you be just really pragmatic about okay i know people don't have a lot of time but let me work with this group of people let's design something together that that they can make time for. Let's design it together so that I, they can help me figure out systemically how to just build it in to their daily lives so that it's not actually an extra thing. It's just sort of baked into what they yeah. do. A lot of companies are trying to bring people to them, but you have to go to your employees. Yeah. And I think that's Yeah, I mean, sometimes we bring them in, but I'll give you another example though. So one thing that um, I used to do quite a bit in my last year at General Mills that I'm going to be bringing back into Fortive is what I call mini self-experiments. How can you bring leaders in and in in part of their development and helping them to understand how to change behaviors how can you use some of that time is actually what i would consider working time i'm all about maximizing the time that i have leaders together and it's not just them you know taking it all in and learning it's let's build out our plan what we're actually going to do moving forward so this idea of mini self experiments which to me i mean i think well designed mini self experiments are more valuable than a 3 month leadership session I'll just make a pretty bold claim like that. Um, But it's this idea of how can you build something that's small, but will have a really big impact on your behavior will make you really uncomfortable. But if you do it over and over again, you will slowly begin to change behavior. Um, So I'll give you an example of one that, um, that I did a couple of years ago in my previous role. Um, I had sort of this challenge that I was facing of perfectionism. So Um, everything I did, it probably took me three times longer than it needed to, especially something like if I was going to be on stage in front of, you know, an audience of 300 people, the amount of prep that I would put into that, I mean, it just wasn't, it wasn't feasible for the other work that I had to do. It was like, you know, days, weeks of prep for like 20 minutes on the stage. And so, um, I created this mini self experiment for myself, um, called the one hour challenge. And I had a 20 minute um, presentation for a group of 300 people and I only gave myself one hour to prepare. That meant one hour to do everything I needed to do. And that was for anybody involved. So I had somebody else who was building my slides. I gave her 30 minutes of it or 40 minutes of it. And then all I had was 10 or 20 minutes to think through what the message was going to be. It was a topic I knew really well. So I didn't have to overthink it. Although had I not done this, I would have overthought it. Um, And then 10 minutes for me to actually prep and run through it once, you know, out loud. And then the rest of the time for her to build slides or videos or whatever she needed to build. And that was it. And you know what? I went on stage. I felt sick. I mean, I, on, I literally felt like I was going to get sick before I went on stage because I felt so unprepared. The 20 minutes went by. It was great. Actually, it was part of HR's development too. So I actually told them at the end what I was doing. And that to me was more, more of a game changer than any executive development program I could have gone on. Mm-hmm. It was more of a, a positive change for me as a leader to say, Hey, you're going to do this and it's going to make you scared and uncomfortable. But like that has carried forward. I no longer spend days, weeks, months prepping for something that I need to present. I spend the appropriate amount of time. I don't wing it, but <laughs> things like that. So if you can take sure. leaders and, and have them design these little self experiments and give them opportunities that they already know that are coming up. So it's not an extra thing to do, bake it in and actually in that case, you know, show the value where it saved me a bunch of time. Like that to me is so much more powerful. So where do you see the biggest improvement, the area of improvement then for the sort of the next six to 12 months? Where's your main, the majority of your energy and focus being? It's going to be in two areas. The one, one is around taking our core business system, which again is just core to who we are and what we do. Um, and 
and making it more accessible. When I use the word accessible, I don't just mean access, although I do, but I also mean accessible in terms of making it palatable for the average employee to be able sure. to understand it and do something with it. Some of it is pretty complicated. And I think that while these are complicated processes, I also think that we've sort of, we've potentially over-engineered and over-complicated them a bit. So creating something that the average employee can take and do something with and apply effectively to help the business grow. And then on the other side is around leadership. So we've, we're starting to stand some things up for our high potential leaders, for our most senior leaders, um, but really building out a broad suite of experiences that our leaders um, can, can access. Um, and you know, some of it is attend, some of it is just purely about access and building that community so that we do have stronger leaders for the future. I do think, I mean, I think leadership, it's a tough one because it's changing. Yep. Um, and this idea of, you know, leadership going from sort of compliance to what I would consider it's shifting more towards initiative now, like leaders, great leaders now are ones who can sort of energize and create initiative on their teams, provide that strategy, that vision, but it's not about compliance anymore. Yep. And I think, you know, that requires a different skill set and it requires different behaviors. I think it requires a ton of courage and confidence. It really does. Like confidently take your hands off the work and let the people you know, hire smart people and let them be smart. Like mm -hmm. that is a, that is a mind shift. I know you've built multiple pro uh, leadership development programs over the years. What, what advice would you give to people that are building leadership development programs? Leadership development programs and learning more generally is not a bandaid that you slap on a problem. That would be to me the biggest advice because people come to me all the time, you know, with, Hey, can you, can you create a training? Can you create a program? Which if they use the words training and program, usually I'm just like, you know, <laughs> Doing it. Um, because it's, it's, yeah, because it's not it's not a one-off experience. It's, it's like not. Well, <laughs> that's why I use the word experience so much. But too often, I think people who sit in in my seat and people who do this kind of work, we we want to help people and we're eager to help people. And so we hear things like that and we just start building. And you know, if you were to tell me today, hey, you have one day to build something to develop new leaders of people, and you have a three day, you're going to run a three day program. I could build it in one day. I could build something in one day, I should say. Um, but it's really that taking that step back, being thoughtful, be a consultant, be a good partner to the business, understand where the business is growing, and then ensure that the learning is supporting that growth. We don't do learning for the sake of learning. We do learning for the sake of growing our businesses and growing our employees to help lead those businesses. And so just never losing sight of that, because if you're starting to feel like you're spinning and you're just kind of caught up in the grind, that tells me that you're probably not focused on the few biggest, my team laughs, I, I always use the word boulders, but the two or three biggest boulders that are really going to move the needle versus all of the other stuff that's just, you know, two years back, you're going to look back and say, eh, it was just stuff. It was yeah. just probably learnings, you know, but it didn't really move the needle. Well, look, Susie, this leads us quite nice on sort of quick fire round, right? So <laughs> I'm going to ask you five questions and you have no okay. longer than 30 seconds to give us some amazing answers. Okay. <laughs> are, you ready? are you ready? Yes. Um, what was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a senior leader? Quite fitting, considering what you just said. <laughs> I would say my own self-doubt and my, my doubt that my past experiences or even my formal education was enough to enable me to lead in HR at a senior level. What was the uh, best piece of business advice you've ever received? So I don't remember the exact way the person stated it. I remember parts of it, um, but there were a lot of bad words, so I can't say it verbatim. But I was challenged by a leader about five to seven years ago when she realized that I was coming across as a very inauthentic version of myself. And she, behind closed doors, would see this authentic version of me. And then in meetings, she'd see this different version of me. And she pushed me really hard to say, who did this to you? I don't know why you are a different person with all of these other people than you are with me and really encouraged me and made me feel confident and more comfortable to be my true self and, and really figure out who I needed to be as a leader, not just who I thought people wanted me to be. So it's, it's about being an authentic leader and really being in touch with who that is for you, not just who your company thinks you should be. Um, what are some books you'd recommend to our audience and why? First of all, nudge. I think a lot of the work that we do in HR is around changing behavior, and um, it's something that's really hard to do, almost impossible to do. Um, so nudge is a book that sort of just helps you understand, like it's more from kind of a consumer lens, but how to change behavior over time. And it's about these sort of small moments versus a big change, thinking that that's going to change 
um, people's behavior. Um, I'm, I don't know if I can recommend it because I haven't finished it yet, but I'm on the new um, Brene Brown. So far, highly relatable. First of all, I just like the way she writes. It's, um, it's very approachable. Um, but also just really relatable. And it's this idea of being a vulnerable leader, which I think also kind of connects to my previous answer about authenticity. Dare and, to lead, right? Is that the one? Yes, dare to lead. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so it, I think it is about that kind of that vulnerability, the authenticity that we need to have as leaders. And um, I think that that one is really powerful for not only for me as I develop other leaders, but also for me and my own leadership. And then what about some internet resource? You know, if, if we go on your browser <laughs> or some apps on your phone or some resources, what, what are some of the resources that you use to stay productive or stay up to date with current events, you know, news, etc.? Yeah, well, my most Google, my most recent Google uh, search, I think, was how to make a baby sleep. Um, <laughs> <but that's, laughs> me too. We, sh- we both share that one. <laughs> right. If you're really in my browser, that's what you're going to see. Um, yeah. So a few, a, a few things that I love. First of all, um, there's this um, blog post by someone named Seth Godin. He's a marketer. I know who that is. I okay. I mean, it, it's amazing, even though it is certainly targeted towards marketing folks, there maybe I would say 95% of it completely applies to just about everybody else. Um, so that I, I start every single day by reading that. Um, I read the hustle just to kind of know what's happening in industry um, because it's important, you know, I, I'm certainly more interested in anything related to HR, anything related to learning, but I also think it's really important that we stay grounded in what's just happening in business around us and the industries in which we compete. Um, so I read the hustle uh, every day. If you were to look in my browser, um, you know, you're going to find a lot of, I spend a lot of time on TED Talks. I spend a lot of time on Forbes.com, Harvard.com, um, um, really just kind of looking for the kind of the latest research interviews with, um, you know, thought leaders. So that's where a lot of my, a lot of my searches end up sure. taking. And then last question, what's one thing about your business you are in now that you're most excited about? It's got to be the growth and sort of the, the unknowns from where I sit. So we are just growing rapidly as a company and we're doing that organically and inorganically. But just this prospect that we are this decent sized company that's eventually, you know, we're, we've got about 26,000 people, I think, and between six and seven billion dollars in revenue and just the prospect of all of that growth and what that means for um, you know selfishly for the HR function and for for learning and leadership and the the importance of the work that we're doing to help enable that growth in so many ways and the the impact that'll have on talent and our talent practices it's just so exciting and and also just the impact that that my company and then the companies within our company have on the world and really advancing technology and advancing so many different um, kind of industries that we work in is just, it's just super exciting. And I'm excited to see where it goes. Well, it sounds like you're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> so before we go, if there's one part in piece of advice you could give to sort of leaders that are on their journey, what would that be? And also if anyone has any questions or wants to connect with you, what's the best way for them to connect with you? So advice to leaders on their journey, I would just, uh, my advice is to not compare your journey to anyone else's. That is probably in addition to my own sort of self-doubt, it's the thing that kind of holds me back. I'll start to take two steps forward and I look at someone else who looks like they've taken three steps forward and I get frustrated. Don't do that. It's your own journey. You are the type of leader that you're meant to be. So become that authentic leader and, and dig within yourself to find it. So that's my advice. As far as people reaching out, um, they are welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn or you know, I don't know if you want me to share my email address, but LinkedIn's probably the best way. I'm LinkedIn's fine. LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, so find me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to connect and chat more. I love connecting with other people in HR who are doing uh, interesting work. Um, I, as much as you might want to learn from me, I want to learn from you too. So I'm always happy Fantastic. to do that. Well, guys, as always, if you head over to hrdleaders.com, you'll find the show notes for an episode. Everything that we've been talking about will be linked there. All the links to the resources that I mentioned will be there for you. Uh, again, Susie, thank you for taking the time out to join us and uh, I wish you all the best until Thanks, we next week. Too.